Okay, well, look, thank you very much for uh, having me here. Um, I appreciate this is not a good time for you to take time out to, uh, to come to a talk like this, but hopefully uh, it'll give you a different insight uh, on this topic of uh, uh, the science policy interface. Uh, I'm going to talk about a lot of ex this in the sense of climate change because that's what I've done for the last 40 years. Um, but in fact, the messages, many of them apply to all sorts of areas of where science is contributing new knowledge and that that knowledge has been then potentially used in the development of policy in either the private sector or the public sector. If we have the first slide. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the science uh, part of it and the action, trying to get action associated with what science has found out about the climate change issue. Uh, a bit about managing risk uh, and the behavioural aspects uh, to this whole problem of the interface between science and policy and then managing the complexity of that uh, problem. Next slide. Um, I'm not going to read right through this uh, but you can scan your eyes. This actually uh, at, at Copenhagen in 2010 there was a major physical science meeting that was looking at what do we actually know about the climate change issue. Um, and uh, at the end of that, uh, it was reported that many of the scientists were saying one of two things. We're worried that people are not psychologically prepared to deal with this issue and that in fact therefore they're choosing the simple solution, that is uh, to ignore it, do nothing. Um, or they were concerned about the fault was really theirs, that they were not conveying the information in a way that was suitable for policymakers or for the community at large to actually respond. And these are quotations for any of you who have in, been involved in climate science. We'll see that the names here are people who are very much world leaders in the science, including the bottom one, which is James Lovelock, who some of you will have heard uh, uh, about. And they're all about fear and concerns that these people have. And mostly, my colleagues in the climate science uh, tend to uh, blame themselves a lot about this. And in fact, there is a potential for a trap to think that it's only your fault and therefore try to improve the science. So go back to the laboratory and try to do a bit more to get the proof and make it more convincing or to try to spend time thinking about how you communicate. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of that in, in a moment. But this is the way uh, I see the climate change issue and it's, it'll, it's a prelude to the way I'm thinking about this particular issue. For most of my career, I spent up here in the physical climate area and then eventually was managing a, a whole um, institute that was researching the impacts of climate change, building climate models, as well as looking at the greenhouse gases and so on. And then in the latter years, became interested in the energy side of it. But in the last few years, working with psychologists, understanding that really this is simply about us. It's about how many people we have and the level of affluence each of us wants, which is very closely tied to the uh, amount of energy we use. And in all of these stages, there are human behavioural issues and so my criticism of the science community, if there is one, and me included, is that we waited much, much too long to get the behavioural science community working alongside of us uh, in this issue. So this is uh, when I was uh, a senior manager of a CSIRO and I was, I was on the executive of CSIRO, which is a 6,500 uh, researcher unit covers most areas of research in the Australian context. Uh, this was my thoughts uh, at that time about the science policy interface. It says that if you have scientists, but you can actually talk about any experts here, other kinds of scientists other than physical scientists, but uh, economists, engineers, people who are expert in their uh, field, um, and you on the other hand have policy makers over here, there's an interface that I've indicated as shade of colour to indicate that there is not a, a, a simple wall between these two things. That science policy interface is not about 
scientists offering through a hole in the wall to people the other side information that they'll then make policy out of. It's much more complicated than that. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was actually established to try to improve this linkage. Um, I was involved with people around in 1988 when, when this was set up. And it was because there was a concern that all of the stuff that was being generated here, mainly in scientific journals, was not uh, understandable, it was not in a coherent, uh, holistic frame for people over here, the CEOs of companies or the ministers in governments, uh, to actually use to produce uh, policy. And so that's what it was uh, about. And in fact, I think overall it's done a very good job in this, aside from my criticism about not involving enough behavioural scientists. But there are other, many other ways, and the, this diagram doesn't show them all. But for example, um, in my old organisation, we would do contracts for uh, departments of uh, government, whether they be the federal government or state governments, or we'd do contracts for companies where they would say, this is a component of climate change we need to know more about in order to develop a policy or to manage or understand our risk, uh, to manage that risk. Uh, here is a contract, so much money, you do this for us. That is, in fact, a science policy interface. Um, briefings. In Australia, we have a thing called the Prime Minister's Science uh, Engineering Innovation Council. And it, uh, the Prime Minister will periodically uh, set up a meeting from a few senior scientists dealing with one topic where he personally, with his ministers, will sit and listen and ask questions uh, from the experts. So this is an interface that can actually be very powerful because you're dealing directly between senior scientists here or senior experts and the people who are actually going to, in, the case of, in this case, in the government, make decisions. But there are peak bodies of, org of organisations, uh, the coal industry, the gas industry, uh, these peak bodies, they also seek bri briefings and that's an opportunity for this interface to take uh, place. Um, and then there's, of course, the media. Um, and that's an interesting one because most scientists, when they actually uh, interface with the media, uh, which is a mechanism for actually getting to public perception, which then can influence both public and private policy, when they do it, they are split between two objectives. Uh, one of them is to actually put their research forward to seek support to continue to do it. And the other one is to simply convey information. And whenever you're doing this, it's very important you understand what you're doing. I'm not against people going to actually promote their position and, and the future of their research, but you don't want to get them mixed up. You want to know exactly what you're trying to actually communicate uh, in this uh, process. Now, for each of these, if we go to the next slide, Unfortunately, there are barriers, and I, I, again, I won't go in detail through this slide, but to point out what I mean. Uh, in the situation where you're actually dealing with, say, contracts, uh, I saw this on dozens of occasions where uh, we would do the piece of work according to what the contractor wanted and write a report, but then the person who was in the bureaucracy before handing the report to the minister would want words changed. That is a gatekeeper. That person actually has power to control, to some extent, the exchange of information across uh, that interface. And there are many examples of gatekeepers. A lot of gatekeepers are actually ignorant of the fact they're doing it. Um, they think they're doing the minister a turn because they know the minister doesn't want to hear this. Uh, well, that's still gate. Keeping. Uh, purchase a provider model. Um, this is a situation where uh, we were talking about this earlier, 
where in, certainly in Australia, but in many parts of the world now, uh, partly because of my generation of scientists going off and doing whatever we wanted to do, and then people starting to turn, say, we're spending taxpayers' money, we want to be, you to be accountable, we therefore want you to do things that the rest of us think you should be doing. So we will now purchase your research on the basis that you do what we think is necessary. That's the same as the contracts being uh, made. The problem with that, there is no real problem in principle with that because it does mean to say that people don't spend the rest of their academic career being paid by their government to do research on something that is entirely irrelevant. But who knows what's going to be entirely irrelevant. So if you go too far down this track, then you finish up with actually dispensing with the insight and the value of the science that the scientists themselves can offer to determine uh, directions. This is a, a serious problem, I think, in the production of science that's useful for policy makers, being biased already by the policy makers themselves. Uh, that's a problem. The media, of course, media want a narrative, a story. They want to be able to tell a nice, glossy story. And so the facts don't want to get in the way of that story too much. So there's a problem there in terms of anyone who's dealt with the media. Often when you read in the newspaper the next day, what you're quoted as saying is somewhat different to what you actually said because it didn't fit the storyline that they wanted. Um, and then this one here the emerg is similar. The emergency... Uh, emergence of a non, uh, the non-reality world, I'm going to talk a little bit more about after. There are issues around timescales um, that the, the scientists, climate scientists, uh, we've been working on creating models that try to tell us something about what's going to happen between now and 2100. Well, most policy makers you deal with have no interest whatsoever in that. Uh, their interest is in, if you're in a, a private company, is the next few years, in some cases as, as much as the next quarter. Um, in, in Australia, most uh, CEOs of companies actually only last about three years. In that time, they've made so much money, they don't need to continue to do it. Um, it's, it that's a problem with the conversion. And, and sheer complexity. I'm going to come back to that. Next slide, thanks. Um, so, the, just going back slightly to the consequence of the purchase of provider is that there is a real potential loss of balance between strategic research and, um, and immediate application and knowledge generation application. These two things are in contrast. And uh, there's regional projections um, versus underpinning climate science. We have problems in the climate science itself uh, as where our governments come to us and say, we want you to concentrate on telling us what's going to happen in our town. And they're un they, they, they can't realise that you can't do that unless you actually understand the global climate system. And if the uh, contracts are all leased on the basis of this arrangement, you will actually not underpin the regional stuff as well as you should have. So what this raises is that those of us who are in science uh, have to be clear when we're, uh, what we're doing. Are we actually policy advocates? We're the expert, we think, on this side. Are we going to advocate how we think the world or policy should be in the private or public sector? Um, in, in that case, ex the expertise can be no more than supporting a position that you actually happen to think personally is the right way uh, forward. Um, now, in some cases, the irony of this is the policy developer likes that because if an expert comes to them with a clear, cohesion view of the way forward, this is something that they can actually sell to their constituency. And so, in some cases, they would prefer it to be that way, but it's not a really good idea. What we really want is independent experts, people who uh, provide an assessment uh, rather than their personal view. And that's effectively what uh, IPC has, has tried to do. And it raises uh, another way of uh, determining this, rather than it being an advocate or an expert, 
but being an honest broker of information that you derive from your uh, research uh, uh, effort. Um, now, I said I'd mention just very briefly, and I'm definitely not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, uh, this is a list of, that comes off the web, you can check it out, um, about things that you should do if you're going to talk to someone else about the climate change issue, and particularly if you think they're sceptical, and you're trying to convey what you know about the science uh, across. And I've, I've, I think that uh, all of these points are valid, and they're useful things to know, and I've used them myself, but I think it misses the point that, in fact, that might not be the problem. The problem might be actually more si systemic than uh, it's just that I'm not speaking the right kind of language for the policy maker to under understand. The next slide, I think, is just a more detailed one of that, and we'll, we'll, we'll go miss that one. Uh, but I'll leave these slides with you so that you can have a look. Okay, so let's talk about managing risk and behaviour. By the way, that's a crocodile in the water in Northern Australia. Managing risk is really about assessing the probability of something happen, happening, and then assessing the magnitude of the impact if it does, and weighing these two things. And we all do it all day. When I got in the taxi to come here, I can tell you I was managing the risk because I'm not familiar with driving in traffic like that at all, and for me it's very scary. Uh, but we all do that every, uh, almost every hour of every day we're doing that. And in fact, if you look at it, this is like a probability there's a probability of something happening, but there's a probability because we don't know for sure exactly what the impact will be. There's some kind of distribution around that as well. Now, do you think the average person uh, in the community is going to actually sit down and think about this in terms of probabilities? Of course not. But they will come to some assessment of their potential exposure. Now, of, of course, all sorts of things can actually intervene. when when we start to run out of rainfall in some area or the coast comes up, there are things that we can actually do to spontaneously adapt to that, which will lower the risk, but there will nearly always be some residual vulnerability. And the climate change community has talked about that as saying we need to have a strategy for A, coming in at the top and minimising this, that is mitigating the problem in the first place, and B, accepting that we have to, uh, we're going to be left with some vulnerability and we have to manage that through uh, adaptation. So straight away, this is a complex issue that's not easy to convey to anyone. Um, and uh, that'll apply to uh, your uh, nearest friends and your parents and relatives as much as to any po policy maker. This down here actually mean, uh, says policy uh, development. Okay, so it says that somewhere between what the real world is out there, and none of us really know that, um, and making policy development that responds to that real world, there's this stuff happening. And this is a physical scientist view of the world. It says experts like me, if I want to uh, think that I can do these things so well, uh, will actually uh, assess through rational thinking, which means formal observations, hypothesis testing, experimentation and deduction, what the real world looks like. And uh, then ideally pass this through to the policy developers down the bottom. The problem with that, of course, is that most of us, like me, know only one tiny little fraction about the real world and there are lots of other experts, scientists, economists, engineers out there that know other small fractions and that ideally our policy should be developed by trying to actually bring these together in some way. What are the social implications? What are the um, biological implications? Uh, what are the um, economic implications, the physical uh, implications? Uh, even the spiritual Im implications, all of those things. And then, uh, this is the reason why 
uh, holistic rationalism has become very popular. And I suspect uh, in India this is the case, or I'm not uh, aware of what's happening here, but in many countries people are setting up what they call sustainability institutes. Um, and the whole idea of this is that you actually employ alongside of each other physical scientists, biological scientists, behavioral scientists, sociologists, uh, economists, to try to get at using this rational approach to things but integrating into a more holistic form the kind of information that you feed back down here. We, mu we do need more of this. Um, the problem is we can't do away with the individual disciplines either. So it's a balance for how much we do. This is what um, people call evidence-based information. And if you go, certainly in Australia, if you go to any department of any government in, uh, in Australia and ask them how they make policy, they'll say, we make it on evidence-based. They really believe this. Of course, there's a filter in here that occurs with, with uh, vested interests and so on, people pleading for alternative positions. That means it's not, this information doesn't get through. But I'm trying to emphasize not perfect in the first place because of this problem. However, the situation's worse than that. And the situation's worse than that because all of us, uh, those of us who are experts in one area, for the vast majority of the rest of our life, sit out here with the community at large and we construct in our minds a view of the way the world is. Uh, and we'll do that from observations. They won't be rigorously uh, what I've called formal observations here. Uh, we'll do it from what our culture says or what our rules exist within our society, uh, the kind of education we've had, uh, beliefs that we have, myths and opinions. And most of our constructed view of the world, which I'm simply calling here the non-reality world, um, that's the way we do it. And we have no other option because none of us can have all of this in all of the aspects of the real world to be able to construct uh, a view of the world that is on an entirely rational basis. The problem is that the people down here making policy are with us. They've constructed their own view of the world as well in this way um, and they might be influenced by the policy, uh, by this uh, evidence-based information, but they are also very much influenced by what comes down here. And when the truth comes out and polit politicians have to weigh the probability of getting re-elected um, and there is a strong opinion coming down from the community up here, that's going to actually have a big impact. So this is an issue for the science policy interface. We're not the only conveyors of information to to these people. Um, I like this and I threw it in uh, because uh, this relates to my concern over my colleagues who think that it's only just a matter of actually doing a little bit more research and refining the message and everything will be okay. People will see the light. They'll see it the way I see it and they'll do what I think should be done. Um, but what he's saying is the great enemy of truth is not often the lie, that is, we deny that there is an existence of this, whether it's contrived because of vested interests or what, it's dishonest, but it's the myth. It's the myth that can be persistent and pervasive and unrealistic. In other words, it doesn't describe the real world that is important. Belief in myths allows a comfort uh, of um, opinion without uh, discomfort of thought. I think it's a very important statement um, and y you can understand when you read something like that, well firstly I, can't, I don't know of any politicians in my country that have the wisdom to actually write something like that, um, but it also tells you that uh, this is part of the problem of actually conveying things. People are actually very uh, much persuaded by myths and I'll come back to one of those now. And I'll put this in because I knew of your interest and we'll talk a bit more about that when I present on the biofuels. 
Um, but one of the myths that you deal with quite often when you're talking with groups about climate change is that they believe that the world and Mother Nature is so strong and so powerful that we as a species could not impact on it. That is a belief and it's a mythological belief um, and science of course is breaking that down and saying well we can now tell you that in fact uh, uh, the nitrogen cycle that's generated by humans is much bigger than the natural nitrogen cycle and you can do that from, uh, from that kind of result. But here is an example of, that deals with the biofuel issue and the uh, idea that we can actually do quite a lot about relieving our energy uh, demands by using biofuels. These blue lines are, uh, were published in a, a paper in Energy Policy earlier this year and the red line is for India. I calculated it before it came so that uh, I could show you. But what, when I first did the first calculation, I of course did for my country, what this diagram shows is that the energy consumed um, by Australia uh, as a percentage of net primary production is 11%. So already this huge co continent and all of the biology of the whole of the continent capturing solar energy and transforming it into biomass is only 10 times bigger than what we're already using in that country uh, of 20 million people. Uh, w then I got surprised when I calculated these two. The US and China already, their energy consumption, their primary energy consumption equals the total amount of energy captured by all photosynthesis for those nations. And when I did it for India, you're in a position where you currently are consuming energy um, at a rate that's 10 times that that your natural biology can collect. Now this, uh, this then really actually can, uh, faces up to a myth that people have that there is all this natural system out there that we can use. And I'm going to talk more about that tomorrow and I, and I don't want to go into other details. It's not doesn't mean you can't use biofuels, but it means you have to be very cautious. So there are human uh, dimensions of this whole problem of climate change, but also the conveying of information. One is the construction of worldviews, the problem of assessing risk, uh, very complicated and we, we all do it in a very, very uh, haphazard way. Uh, what constitutes a rational argument I found from dealing with bio, uh, social, uh, with behavioral scientists that actually um, there is no common view of what a rational argument is. Those of us in this room, probably because of our education, will have a fairly agreed view of what a rational argument is. But if you go to the wider community, you find that in fact uh, what constitutes a rational argument is viewed differently. There are some differences even between the social sciences and the physical sciences. Uh, so when you try to do research where you've got those two kinds of people together, one of the first hurdles you have to overcome is to coming some agreement as to what you mean by a rational argument. Um, there is uh, the whole issue that people do rationalise their situation in the face of their constructed views, that is we believe Mother Nature is so big so we'll rationalise there, or vested interests. We really don't want um, solar energy in Australia because we've got all this coal and gas and people own it and they want to sell it. Uh, coping with mechanisms to avert unwanted emotions. Really shocked to find in working with psychologists that if you uh, stand in front of an audience like this and you provide them with very, very uh, serious information about the climate, not everyone in the room will share the same emotion. There will be at least a half a dozen, maybe ten different forms of emotion and each of those emotions will be dealt with by you personally in the way you've learned through your life to deal with that emotion. And in some cases, it's denial. It's very, that's a very common one. I don't believe that problem exists, and that takes the emotion away. 
but there are others. There are quite a range of them. Uh, that was a real shock to me because after spending many, many years providing stories to, uh, to people uh, from all sorts of walks of life about climate change, realising that I was always talking to a very diverse group of brains who are not responding to the same words in the same way. Uh, that's an important issue. And it applies again in the policy areas. Um, there are, of course, uh, conservative um, social structures that we have to deal with as well. But the bottom line is that climate change, um, global change in general, uh, is a human behavioural issue as much as a physical science uh, issue, an engineering one. I'm in, in two academies in Australia. One of them is an engineering academy and I am constantly at war with those guys because they believe that engineering can solve every problem. Uh, and it's just not true, of course. Um, managing complexity. I won't go for too much longer, uh, but there are a few slides I'd like to share on this issue. Um, some issues that deserve attention. I've already mentioned the holism issue. Um, policy uh, needs to be developed in a holistic way. Uh, with a couple of colleagues, I did a very large study uh, about four years ago on the motor vehicle uh, futures in Australia. And we actually tried to look at that from the point of view of scarcity of oil supply, balance of trade issues, uh, security of supply, uh, CO2 outputs, uh, human health issues around the, uh, the um, pollution associated with cars, as well as the provision of, um, of mobility, um, holistic. And we went with a study that says, here's some ways of thinking about the policy that you, we really need to go forward, with all of these being somewhat uncertain. And the very first thing that every minister said when we got into his room to talk about it was, well, tell me about my bit. And the whole point of the study was that it wasn't about one bit. It was about how do we actually have a set of policies that deal simultaneously, maximise the human health issues, balance of trade issues, uh, the climate change issue and so on. Very hard problem to actually overcome. We all tend to do this. Science policy interface, there are many of these barriers that exist that I've talked about and barriers to a human response. Climate change really is about it. It's about why we need this energy how we, and how we uh, source it, but it's also about how, why we're rejecting, at least in my country, any real solid attempts to lower emissions and do something about it. The holistic assessments are essential but difficult because they're made difficult by sectoralism. And sectoralism exists, and I'll show on the next slide, in various parts of the society. But what it means is that many of us will be trained as physical scientists or biological scientists or even more specifically um, as uh, subsections of those areas, uh, or in very many of the subsectional areas of behavioural science. And when you try to actually get together and discuss things together, there are language problems. Um, and there's a level of holism, because when you, as soon as you do a study like the future of motor cars in a country, you realise it's too big a problem to bring in all of the components that you really need. So you can only take holism to a certain level and becomes impractical to, to do any more. And those who maximise their value by ignoring the benefits and uh, disbenefits to others, um, we're confronted that with every day. Uh, people are trying, whether it be individual people, individual governments, you know, we see this between the states in Australia, each competing very, very strongly against each other, with uh, very little concern about the national interest, but of course we see it between countries. Um, but I wanted to uh, say also a little bit about the problem of uh, markets, um, because uh, policy is being developed by people in governments and in uh, the private sector 
who strongly believe in the value of markets. That's where we are at. And in fact, most of us do uh, have quite a lot of confidence that are within the narrow economic sectoral limits. That is, if you are talking about the selling of electricity, the selling of coal, whatever it is, then you can maximise efficiency and deliver delivery to consumers by having the market really determine. But it is an ideologically held view. And people who hold this view ideologically are actually incapable of moving away from it in any sort of way. And unfortunately, many people that get to senior levels of companies and governments are like this. Um, but what they don't guarantee is that they deliver balanced community-wide value. And this is because there are systemic whole of community markets. There's what is the value of this to the whole of the community. And that is a much more complicated issue than this. And uh, it, it's about, going back to the motor car deal, it's about saying, well, yes, it might be good from your perspective that we do this about the future of motor cars, or good from your perspective that we do this, but from a holistic perspective of the whole of the nation and all of the community, then there will be some other subset of actions that we will take. This is very difficult ground. It's very difficult ground. Uh, again, it comes back to individuals within uh, senior management of a company will see their responsibility uh, as you would like them, if you're a shareholder of that company, to be simply forwarding the value of that company's uh, shares. Uh, but someone like the government has to be standing back and saying, but in this particular interest, if you do that, then in a holistic view, it is not the, be the best thing. Uh, the segmentation of uh, knowledge generation, which I've referred to, this is all the disciplines that we have, is important and it's part of the problem. But corporate segmentation means uh, that our corporate entities tend to be very narrowly focused. That's the way they're being successful. Um, but governments are as well. So that when you actually go to a minister, the tendency is for him to be set after he's been elected to that ministry, he might have been doing something else last year, uh, to defend that ministry and compete. In the Australian government situation, each of those ministries are, is competing against each other. This kind of sectoralisation in the long term is not a good thing uh, for us. So we have a state of uncertainty. We have to do the best that we can. Uh, you know, we don't, like some of the scientists were almost suggesting, feel like throwing in the towel, uh, giving up, if you don't know that, that saying. Um, we have to manage the risk as best we uh, can. We have to re retain a portfolio of actions because we never are sure of what the best thing to do is. And again, if you talk to um, policy makers, it's very hard for them not to make a decisive singular decision because that's seen to be strong in the view of the people who elect them and support them. Whereas, in fact, what we really need is people to be able to say, well, we don't know for sure, so we should have an investment in solar energy, wind energy, uh, biomass, or whatever it is. We need a portfolio of actions. And we need to keep options open. It means that actually we need to keep coming back to those decisions on a regular basis and saying, well, what we knew last year is not the same as this year. Our portfolio strengths might need to be a little bit different. If you invest in the uh, share market, that's exactly what you do all the time. And we need that uh, in the society. Uh, regular reviewing of what we, uh, we do. These are a few uh, sites that I'll leave on the board that most of you will be familiar with coming from here. Uh, but they're sites in which the climate change facts, not the policy uh, information are reported, but I thought I'd leave them there for you to, uh, to have a look at. Thank you very much once again for coming along. Uh, appreciate it very much.